Revelation chapter 13. So as you know, we've been working throughout Revelation um, possibly two or three years now when I've been, been speaking. It's been quite a, a long time and we, we started off with the letters to the seven churches and uh, they, they are literal or were literal churches but also they represent uh, church history and they still apply to us today. We saw uh, the person of the Antichrist uh, although we don't have a, a name of a person, we, we could see what the character of this person is like. Um, of course, uh, before that, we saw how the church was raptured up and we put forward that uh, the, uh, the most biblical, uh, the best biblical case for a rapture is a pre tribulation rapture, that this is a future event and something that is going to happen to the church. We've looked at uh, the different judgments of God. And now we find ourselves in chapter 13, uh, which uh, is, has similarities to Daniel 7 and, and the, the beast that Daniel saw, uh, and also it's, it's known really this chapter for the uh, mark of the beast, and for the number 666. And in fact, this is probably one of the most well-known uh, passages in all of scripture, well known in the sense that skeptics and non-Christians are even aware of some of these themes. They're aware of a person of an antichrist, whether they believe in him or uh, that his existence or, or not. They, they have heard of the mark of the beast, they've heard of the 666 number, but they don't really understand what any of that is about. And Hollywood has jumped on this theme and made all sorts of movies uh, about, about these concepts as well. And, and now millions of Americans um, in particular have equipped themselves with survival gear and uh, tins and tins and tins of food ready and, and all storage and, uh, and guns and all sorts of equipment. Um, yet the, the ultimate survival plan that they ignore uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way really uh, to, to get through this, uh, this, this tribulation, is to not go through it at all, it's to be raptured up uh, as part of the Church of Christ. And this chapter, it represents a shift really in the nature of uh, the tribulation. <coughs> and I think, it's my opinion, that we start to move towards the, that second part of the tribulation now known as the Great Tribulation where Antichrist sits on the throne of the Jewish temple, he makes himself, or declares himself, uh, to be God, and, uh, and really, really starts to per persecute and, and press hard on the Jewish people and the Christians alike. And it seems to me uh, that actually this is a, a good place, really, to assess uh, perhaps where we are now on this time frame, or how, how close are we to the rapture? Well, I cannot tell you any dates or years or, or time scale. All I know is we're closer now than we've ever been before, but of course, if you think about it, we all know that anyway. We'll be closer tomorrow than we are today. Um, but we can take a look at current events to uh, somewhat judge the seasons and to see uh, where we are in, in that sense. In Luke 17, Jesus said, as in the days of Noah and as in the days of Lot, uh, it, so it will be at the, the coming of the Son of Man. And um, when, we'll have the, the first slide on, please, sir, when, when, when you're ready. And in the UK now, um, I'm sure you've all heard about a, a lady called Lucy Levy. It was just, um, you know, we, we've heard the conclusion of her October 2022 trial, uh, and Lucy was found guilty of murdering uh, seven, if memory serves, seven babies and attempting to uh, kill uh, six more. I've just got a, a, an image on the screen in case you've missed it, it should come on with a click. That's it. So, the, the UK's most prolific child killer. And obviously, uh, this has caused outrage, disgust, and horror in the, uh, the UK public and, and even across the, the world as well. And in the Bible, we know that the devil hates babies. The devil hates babies. We see it throughout. And if you remember, uh, 
the, uh, the furrow in Egypt, he wanted all the, the infants to be thrown into the Nile. Herod uh, obviously feared all that Jesus would uh, take his place as king. Uh, he wanted all the, uh, the infants, uh, infant male children, to be, uh, to be killed. Um, but the Bible also describes awful, awful practices uh, where babies were, were offered up to Molech, uh, demon, um, false god, idol, uh, they, they would be sacrificed, passed through the fire. Jeremiah and Kings talks about that also. Psalm 106, 36 to 38 describes how children were offered to demons and sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. It was reported that when these sacrifices would take place, that people would bang the drums louder and louder to drown out the screaming. So, you know, just to, to soften our, our ears. And is that not what we do today in the UK? Can we have the next slide, please, sir? And across the world, um, in, in the world now, 73 million people, 73 million babies are killed every single year. Uh, if you just go back one, please. Uh, that, that works out when you do the maths that two babies every second. Two babies every second are killed. And the UK has, has given all this outrage, but we're doing this on every, every, every second across the world. We, we don't really do anything. We don't really say anything. But as in the days of Noah, it will be where child sacrifice now is, is commonplace and it is legal. You know, we have legalised child sacrifice. Um, in the next slide, and, and this captured my attention, um, UFO whistleblower claims US government found non-human bio... Oh, this is a hard word to say. Biologics, is that right? At crash sites. If you see in this one, uh, a senior, or he was, a senior intelligence officer in uh, the USA has claimed that he has evidence of uh, non-human DNA or non-human biology. Uh, at these crash sites. He also said he has spoken with people who have seen uh, people from the RAF, people from the Na Navy uh, and um, whatnot, uh, the American military, and they have reported that they have seen um, a, a UFOs, or what, what's the word they say now? Is it UA UAPs, is it? Um, unidentified aerial uh, phenomena. And they can't explain it. There was a, a video uh, which the US government released a few years ago, and it, and it shows uh, something in the sky going at incredible speed that we cannot go and just make a complete right angle turn. It, it, it's impossible with the technology that we currently have. Now, I'm not saying that there are little green men on other planets coming to visit us, but I am saying as a Christian, this should not surprise us. The Bible talks about demons. These are not aliens, it's demonic, a lot of it. That, that's the thing. It, probably thousands and thousands of these are made up. Hallucinations, overexcited imaginations. But 5%, 2% are probably real. And that would mean that there have been <coughs> reportings, there has been evidence that we have had demonic influence, demonic activity going on right now in the world, and we, we expect that, as in the days of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah? Well, Genesis 6 reports that the demons came, the fallen angels, and they knew, uh, they knew women, and, and it led to the Nephilim. It led to uh, the, the, the giants, really. That's where the giants come from. So, as in the days of Noah, it's all happening right now. Um, Thinking back to our study of Revelation 9, what did 1 Timothy 4 1 tell us? In later times, people will follow the teachings of demons. And have you noticed the media is now so obsessed with aliens? And I've got a video to show in a moment, but just another slide before that. So obsessed with aliens and, uh, and, and the supernatural. The, the biggest selling blockbuster movies right now are the superhero ones where they've got powers and they've got this and it's to make our mind ready for this. What's the great deception going to be? How are they going to describe what happened at the rapture when we're gone? They're not going to say, yeah, Jesus took them. They're going to say aliens took them or something like that. How are they going to explain the millions and millions of people who, um, who have disappeared? 
to start noticing now how often in the news you start seeing UFO or alien drive to make this normal now that we get used to it. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Has anybody heard about this? Yeah. A man has spent fifteen thousand dollars to fulfil his lifelong dream of being a dog. That's how. That's what society is now. This man wants to be a dog. Uh, we can't. You, you know, we've got all transgender surgery now, where we can make ourselves. I'm, I'm using these air quotes into the other sex. You know, by mutilating ourselves and whatnot. Uh, we're, we're not quite permitting people to try and become animals yet, so he's, he's spent thousands of pounds on this high-tech costume, which it, it does look pretty realistic, um, to, and, and he now goes for walkies in, in the park outside to play and fetch, and then he, this is what he lives, he lives as a dog. <laughs> we were mental, man. we were crazy, we are nuts, and we, but, but this, this is the next thing. What, what happened in the days of Noah? Well, the, the Nephilim became it came because of genetic manipulation. Are we now going to start seeing not just transgenderism in the next decade or so? Are we going to start seeing trans species? Is this going to be a thing? You know, could, ten years ago, you know, never thought that would happen. So where are we heading? What's going on? Um, they can clone sheep now, and they do something to fiddle with our DNA and, and try and make this the next stage for people like this. It is mad. Did anybody see in the paper yesterday, yesterday I think it was, that uh, bishops in the Church of England have said, don't come to church today, watch the lionesses, pray that they win, and, and do that Sunday morning instead. So, but Hebrews tells us, as the day is approaching, don't neglect gathering together. I love football, you know, I, I'm not, you, you, I can't wait to get home and watch the match, but it's more important that we're here. This is what matters, this is what's important. Um, this is the video I thought I'd show you. Watch this, I saw this, this is a dog advert, pedigree. And, and look what happens in this video. I am a bandit's first owner was brilliant astronomer. Now to how often you see this in the media because since I don't know I, I've, I've been paying close attention to this I'm seeing it almost every day you know you watch out for this it's, it's crazy how they're sort of gearing this up um, after I uh, put this message together I finished writing it yesterday and then what did I see the first headline I saw it came from my Facebook Yuri Geller we have 10 to 20 years left before the aliens visit us you know now we all know Yuri Geller's mother anyway but this is what's happening. Why does that get a headline story in the papers? Anyway, let's get to the Bible. Let's, uh, let's get to the text. So, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 to 2. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphem blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bird's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. 
So John has another vision. John had lots of visions in Revelation, as we've seen so far. And this time he sees a, a terrifying vision of this beast. And you, you could possibly imagine it a, a bit like a, 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 you know, we use our imagination. This is not what the Bible says. This is my imagination. Maybe like some sort of octopusy creature with all his heads going around and coming out of the sea. And it's absolutely terrifying. And some scholars have even pondered whether they could locate where this is. They, they, they say, okay, John was on Patmos, we know that. Um, so it's a, he was exiled to Patmos, and that's where Revelation was written, that's where he had his vision. So what seas are near Patmos? Well, you've got the Mediterranean Sea, you've got the, which I can't pronounce, is it the a a Aegean, Aegean, I don't know how to say it, that sea uh, next to it. So maybe it's from around that area. Well, actually, chapter four said John, uh, John was told, come up here. So he, he wasn't on Patmos, really, when he had that vision, he'd come up here. Uh, you know, he, he was sort of, uh, he, I, I don't, I think we're reading too much into this text to try and locate where this was. Rather, the sea refers to the unstableness, the fallenness of humanity. That's what's meant by the sea, biblical imagery, rather than a specific location here. So the sea is this unstable mass of fallen humanity spread before John, in other words, out of the chaos, out of the instability, out of the craziness, and we're seeing how crazy things are, that's where this beast comes from. So imagine how crazy things are going to be when the church is raptured. So out of that situation, the beast uh, arrives. And if we follow the principle of allowing the Bible to interpret the Bible, then the best way we can look at this beast is probably to think back to where we've seen similar, similar descriptions, and that would be Revelation 12, what we looked at last time, and Daniel chapter 7. Well, Revelation 12, 3 says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And here, this isn't the same beast in Revelation 12, we're told the devil is Satan. So we, we've got, uh, we, we do have a distinction, but you can see how similar this is. We can see obvious parallels. Um, the, the dragon in Revelation 12 had seven diadems, though not ten. Um, we, we know the dragon as Satan, um, but we, we, we see the same sort of description of seven heads, ten horns, the same nature here. So whatever this beast is in Revelation 13, it's of the same nature of Satan. If we turn to Daniel chapter 7, verses 3 to 8, we get significantly much more interpretation. Very, very tricky passage, really. Uh, Daniel 7, verses 3 to 8. And it says, And four great beasts came up out of the sea, the same location out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bird. It was raised up on one side, it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked and beheld another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, uh, and behold a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns. Behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eye of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. And the, the, the uh, sort of opinion among scholars really is that these four great beasts speak of four great empires throughout history. The first beast represents Babylon, and the wings plucked off 
represents the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember Nebuchadnezzar had to spend some time living as an animal, really. He, he, was, uh, he, he was humbled uh, quite considerably. The burr represents Medo-Persia, with a stronger Persian component being the side that was raised up. The leopard, Alexander the Great, and his speedy conquest of the civilised world. And then the, uh, the, the four heads represent the division of his kingdom into four parts after his death. And the final terrifying beast represents the Roman Empire. There's, uh, the, uh, and, and this Roman Empire, we, we have ten horns and three were, were, were removed. We can see that actually throughout history, um, where as Roman Empire has actually moved over to Europe, uh, and there are seven nations uh, uh, left, the UK being one of them, seven of those horns, uh, the UK, you've got France, I think, Portugal, Italy, Spain, I can't remember them all, Germany, and then of the horns put up, you've got the, uh, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and something else, my, uh, which escapes me. Um, and now we see that again we see the same terminology now we see we see the uh, the, the leopard we see the the uh, the lion we see the the bird now and what revelation 13 is saying now is that actually this beast has components it has parts of all these empires throughout history but it's bringing them together so we've got the components of Babylon, we've got the, uh, the Medo-Persia element to it, we've got Alexander the Great's Greece, we've got the Roman Empire, and it brings it together to make a fullness of evil, a completeness, that this empire, this tribulational empire, as it were, is going to be worse than any of them before. It's going to be stronger than them before. It's going to be a more fuller uh, form of, of evil, if you like. The seven heads represent a further completeness. Now, if you look throughout history, there are seven empires which, uh, which, which are clearly satanic, and we, we can see that, and we saw it last time in our, in, when we were looking at Revelation 12, because of the way they pursued and the way they persecute, persecuted the Jewish people. That's how we know it's satanic, because it's anti-Semitic. Now, those empires, we have Babylon again, Medo-Persia, um, but we also have Egypt, we have Assyria, we have um, uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the seventh is this tribulational empire. And this tribulational empire, we now read verse 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And verse 4, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight it? Well, if you know your history, the Roman Empire was never actually defeated. It appears to have been defeated because it's disappeared and we don't have it now. So it, is, it had this, what seemed like a mortal wound, but then... The Antichrist is going to come back. We read this in one of the previous chapters from that old Roman Empire. It's going to be a revived Roman Empire. So it looks as though it's been wounded. It looks as though it's been killed. But then it, it wound healed. It come back. So this refers, this refers to two things in one go. You've got the beasts from Daniel 7 are clearly kingdoms. So we're going to have this whole sort of world empire, this whole global government sort of thing, which the Antichrist is going to head up. But then this wound can refer possibly, possibly, to the Antichrist himself as a person. Because in Revelation 20, verse 10, we were told that the beast was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, we're not getting seeing metaphors, and we're not seeing kingdoms that are thrown into the lake of fire, but it's individuals who receive judgment. So we've got a situation now where the beast both represents kingdoms and it represents the person of the Antichrist. You can read this two ways, which makes this fascinating because there's double layers to this prophecy, but it also makes it quite complicated because is this the kingdom or is this the person? There's a really interesting verse in Zechariah 11:17, and it's describing the worthless shepherd. 
And the word the shepherd in Zechariah 11.17 has a withered hand and is blinded in the right eye. So it's possible that that could refer to this mortal wound. There could be an assassination attempt made on the Antichrist, and it may appear as though he died. He may try and mimic Jesus' death and resurrection. He may try and copy that, because what does Satan do? He copies what, the dead, uh, what Jesus has done. He copies, he counterfeits. <coughs> he may see some sort of assassination attempt on the Antichrist. Or he could here refer to the Roman Empire being revived. So it's really interesting exactly what this mortal wound could be. The whole earth, however, is going to marvel at this. The whole earth is going to be amazed. And this leads me to think that it's probably a reference to the person of the Antichrist. Because I don't know many people who are really amazed at history and will think, oh, the Roman Empire is back. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to worship it. <clears throat> but I know people follow people. And people idolize people. I mean, look at the celebrities now. You've got your, your Cristiano Ronaldo and the following that he has, uh, especially among children, really, and, 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 and young teenagers and, and whatnot. Uh, you, you have the most famous singers. Think how popular this charismatic, persuasive, charming, um, powerful person of the Antichrist is going to be. And if he was to survive some sort of assassination attempt, wouldn't the whole non-believing world marvel? Wouldn't they then proceed to worship this person and to, to go from a, 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 an admiration to full on worship, it probably would. So I think this is probably targeting the person of the of the Antichrist here. And this and the world now we learn from, from verse 4 are going to worship the beast. They're going to say, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? Who can beat this guy? He's so powerful, he's so amazing. He's so awesome. I worship this person. My life belongs to this person. That's what people are going to be like. We read now in verses 5 to 10. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and the language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive to the captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So the first thing we read there is, is we get a, a description now of the personality of this, this beast. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. Well, we, we know from 2 Thessalonians 2 4 that Paul says the, the, uh, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, he says he opposes and exalts himself against every so called God or object of worship that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So, in other words, the Antichrist here is Mr. Big Mouth. Is Mr. I am, Mr. Big Me. He thinks he is the best person to have ever walked the planet. He thinks he's so prideful, so full of himself, that he calls himself God. And he re begins to, to, to assume that position, to assume that authority and that power, and he takes his seat in what's going to be a rebuilt Jewish temple. And he starts to blaspheme God. And he's allowed to do this for 42 months. Now, 42 months is three and a half years. This is going to be the second part of the tribulation, at least in my opinion. I think it would represent the second part of the tribulation. And he's going to allow to sort of rule as a global leader, as a global 
one person superpower, if you like, for 42 months and have permission to do that. But no, he needs permission to do that. If you remember the story of Job and the, uh, and the devil had to ask God to take things away from Job, to take his health away, to take his wealth away and his family away, and he had to actually ask permission. And he was granted permission to do whatever he wanted except to take Job's life. He had to, uh, to act in certain parameters which were, were, were ordained by God. And now the Antichrist has this permission to rule for 42 months. And he opened his mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. And then it says a really interesting little add-on to that verse. It says, and those who dwell in heaven. So, he's going to blaspheme us. We dwell in heaven. I mean, that is a curious thought. He's not only blaspheming God, he's not only blaspheming uh, Christ, he's blaspheming <coughs> followers of Christ as well. He's going, to be, he's going to be cursing Christians. He's going to be saying everything that goes wrong is going to be the Christian's fault. Oh, the economy's gone bad because of the Christians. It's their fault. It's going to be them who were taken up. And it's going to be those people who, who, who follow Christ now, they, they, they're the scum of the earth, if you like. Think back to the, the, uh, the, the Nazi German persecution of Jews, the Holocaust, how the Jewish people were, were, were thought of to be subhuman, they were thought of to be vermin and, 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 and cockroaches and described as rats and the caricatures, the imagery where, where they, they, they sort of draw into monsterish looking people with the, the, the big bodies and such and big noses coming down and sort of looking at children like in sinister way. And think of that, think of the propaganda now which is going to face Christian people. There's going to be mass persecution against Christians and it's going to be in the media, it's going to be propagated, it will be Christians fault for everything that goes wrong. So that people start to hate Christians, that other people start to turn against Christians, that other people will start to, to attack and to, uh, to, to, uh, to harm and to take from Christians as well because they worship this guy. They believe everything he says. They're going to copy him. They're going to follow him. They're going to take that hatred for themselves as well. So there's a really uh, fascinating throwaway remark there which tells you now about the society which is going to be like and the hatred to Christians and, and Jewish people uh, as well in this time. <clears throat> So he doesn't just blaspheme God, he also blasphemes Christians, and he's going to make war on the saints. Verse 7 there, and was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. So now we see that the propaganda moves into activity. So the saints are, are victimised, the saints are, are, are uh, described in horrible ways, and then we see the persecution to follow. He makes war on them. His mission at this point is to destroy and to take out every believer in Christ. And we know this from the last study, from Revelation chapter 12, when the, it said the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. That was Revelation 12, 17. And we see that in chapter 13 now, I, there's going to be mass persecution like we've never seen before. Now, if you're a follower of Christ, you're not going to experience this. Remember, we're going to be raptured up. But, if, if, but there are people who think, oh, if a rapture happens, I'll accept Christ then. But their lives are going to be terrible. If, if, if they survived all the other judgments, all the other uh, things which have happened, the earthquakes, the plagues, the, the, the hailstones, the locusts, we, uh, or the, the locusts were for uh, the non-believers, weren't they? But if they've survived all of this, they've now got to survive an oppressive dictator who wants to, to take, to snuff every single one of them out. So it's not a good plan to get your, your tinder beans and your survival gear and think you're waited out. It's not going to work. So he's going to he's declared war on the saints now. And he's going to conquer them. And authority will be given all to over every tribe 
and people and language and nation. So although he's probably, we, we, we expect him to be based in Jerusalem, that's where this Jewish temple is going to be, he's got authority over the global world. So this means two things now. The Antichrist is going to be a global leader. There will be a global government. He's going to head it up. And he is going to not just attack the Christians, the Jewish people in Israel, this is going to be across the whole world. This is a global event. You cannot go to the Bahamas and think you'll sun it out. You'll, you'll, you'll be persecuted there as well. You'll be found there as well. So it, it's, it's a huge, huge oppression, a huge attack like we have never seen before. And it sounds flippant and it sounds distasteful to trivialize the Holocaust of Nazi Germany, for example, that's going to be nothing compared to this. That's going to look light compared to this. This is the severity of what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. And then in verse uh, 8 it says, And all who dwell on earth will worship it. So everyone is going to, is going to be fine with him. You know, it's not all who dwell on earth is going to comply with him. All who dwell on earth is going to tolerate this. Or they're going to disapprove but not act. They're going to worship him. They're going to follow. They're going to they're going to to actually serve him in this process as well and willingly. Worship is willing, isn't it? Worship is something which you choose to do. They're going to buy into this. Note verse ten, which is the call of the Christian of the of the tribulational saints. The call of the Christian at this time. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, he must be slain. Here is the call for the endurance of faith of the saints. So Christians at this time, I, I don't, I, this is part of the following now for Jesus, that the faith that, that is, is going to be tested in the sense that they must endure this now and, and they can expect to be slain with the sword, to, to have their heads chopped off. They can expect to be taken captive. Uh, and I think we'll see in a few verses that they, they can probably ex ex expect to be made slaves as well. The slave trade is going to come back in this time. Um, verses 11 to 16. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet to live. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. So this second beast, the first thing we notice here is, is, is this one rises out of the earth. The first beast rose out of the sea, out of the instability, out of the fallen, uh, nature of mankind out of the chaos but this one comes from the earth so this suggests to me that when we look at this and we look at how everyone was now going to, how everyone was going to worship the antichrist how he, he came promising peace and prosperity it looks to me that he sorted a few things out and because of this obedience and worship to him in some ways the earth isn't quite as chaotic as it was and some order has been established now some sort of reign and control has been established um, so that this second beast comes from a situation which in their perspective is a bit calmer a bit more straightforward and it's like the first beast it ex exercises the all, all the authority that the first beast had but the role of this second beast is to point people toward the first beast so as said before satan counterfeits everything that Christ does. He tries to copy, he tries to, to steal and twist and to make things his own. And we know, in fact, one of the proofs that 
our God is the one true God and not the Muslim God or not any other God. It's that we have a Trinitarian God. Because that means our God is the world. We've got the Father, we have the Son, we've got the Holy Spirit. And you cannot be fully love if there isn't more than two. Because the, 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 the God, uh, God the Father loves the Son, okay, and the Son loves the Father, but together they can experience a different kind of love because they both together love the Spirit. And the Spirit and, and, and the Son both together have that united common love towards a third person. It's like how Sarah and I now have a baby, so we've got a different kind of love because we've got a love shared together towards a third party. Now Allah, the Muslim God, doesn't have that because he's, he's not a trinity, he's one. He doesn't have a relational love, he's not love, he's not a fullness of love. So the Trinity actually proves that our God is, is the real God, is the true God. Uh, but now the devil needs his, his own Trinity. He's got a satanic Trinity. So you've got Satan, who is sort of paralleled in a way to, to the Father. You've got the Antichrist parallel to the Son. And now you've got this false prophet who assumes the role of the Spirit. And the false prophet, we, we, his role, everything he wants to do is to tell people, worship the beast, worship the Antichrist. Worship the devil. That's what he wants people to do. And he tells people to do that. He tells people to, uh, to follow the Antichrist. But he's powerful as well. And that makes him persuasive. If we remember in the book of Acts, the apostles would be able to perform a miracle. Like Paul would be able to, to raise uh, the guy who fell from the window up to life or, or perform healings. And then people would listen to the message because they've got credibility now. They've got they've been able to prove that they can that, that, that there's power behind what they say. The same with Jesus, he would heal people, then he'd preach the gospel, he'd tell people. So now we've got this false prophet who can perform all these signs, he can make fire come down. And I wonder where that fire goes, probably on an old church building or something, and it probably burns something down, wouldn't it? So he calls fire down, everyone is in awe, everyone is inspired, and he says, I have got this power from him, worship him. And he guides everyone to the Antichrist, everyone to Satan. So this, this false prophet um, is the same nature, but we've got that Greek word alos again for another, meaning um, it, the, the same nature. Whenever you have another in Greece, you've either got alos or heteros, uh, and they, they, they tell you secrets, really. If you ask, if somebody gives you a Mars bar and you ask for, uh, for, for alos, you're asking for another Mars bar, and it's something the same. But if they give you a Mars bar and you ask for heteros, you want another chocolate, and it could be a Snickers, it could be a fudge, it could be something different. So same sort of thing, but different. Whereas Amos here is the same nature as the first, so they're part of that satanic trinity, that's what we learn from this word. Um, and it seems to me, this is my opinion now, uh, that the Antichrist, we know from Daniel 9, because he can, he can divide nations, he rules over nations, we've got this, he's got authority now over every tribe, every people, every language. In my mind, he, he seems to be a political guy and a false prophet, a religious guy. He's worship him, worship him. This is how he worship, worship him. Um, and he's doing all these signs, like the magicians, like how we see the Acts of the Apostles do. He's so persuasive, so convincing. And then we see something quite amazing. He can give breath to an image, so that the image might speak. Can I just read that verse again? Um, it exercises all, uh, where are we? Verse 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And verse 14, by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So again, by the sword, we see this was probably an assassination attempt on the Antichrist. Verse 15, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. Now, the, there's a bit of a clue on the screen though. It says, this is not Morgan Freeman. I was going to, I didn't notice that actually. I was going to ask you a question. Has anyone seen this person before? Everyone knows who this guy is? 
Yeah? Okay. You would have all been wrong because this is not a real person. So can we, can we play the video from Sarah? I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? It's one of the most frightening things in the world today. This is terrifying. And I don't know if you're aware of this. This is called deep fake. Deep fake. It was on the news a couple of years ago. It's, it's gone under the radar again now. It's disappeared. Now under the radar, and you've probably all heard Chat GPT. Has anyone heard of Chat GPT? That defect uses Chat GPT technology. So what we've got now, we've got the. I mean, the the false prophet breathed life or, or breathed power or whatever into this image so that it can talk. But this, that could purely be demonic. But we actually have the technology that that can happen now. So that is not a real person. That that's that's not a physical thing. But you, it looks and sounds and, and, and has the mannerisms and the emotion of somebody who we've all seen on our screens. Very famous actor Morgan Freeman. Um, Deep fake uses artificial intelligence so that whatever it is can communicate. Can, can sort of use all the intelligence we've gathered and we've collected together on the internet and actually think and, and come up with answers and interact. But it uses technology now of scanning faces and cloning technology and, uh, and uh, uh, um, simulation so that it can make something look exactly like another person and even sound exactly like. And, and this is frightening because you could deceive anybody in the world with this. Um, when the conflict with the Russia uh, and Ukraine broke out, they did deep fake on President is it Zelensky, the Ukrainian guy, President Zelensky, and there was videos of him telling everyone in Ukraine to lay down their weapons, to stop fighting, and that they surrender to Russia. Now, it looked exactly like him. It sounded exactly like him. And it would convince everyone, except for the fact that he quickly realised what went out there and came out and said, no, that's not me. Keep your weapons. We're not surrendering. So we're in a situation now where we, in a few years' time, possibly when this is mainstream, we don't know what's real. You could be in a church. When, when this, is, this is all computer screen stuff now, and, and, and in... Korea, they've actually got news anchors now, so that they've got 24-hour news, and half the time, it's not a real news anchor on the screen, it's deep fake. And they're actually telling you the news, and they look real, they sound real, but they're just a simulation. So, what happens next, because they're building robots all the time, <coughs> and you're starting to see robots, when they combine robotic technology with deep fake, so that you've got someone who's actually physical and can sound and talk and think just like a real person but isn't real what happens when that person goes and murders someone and the real person gets the blame and gets put in court before for it this is this is terrifying stuff that, that we've got now what happens when you get church leaders who are deep fake now to say Forget everything I've said to you. There is no Jesus. There is no resurrection. It's all a lie. What happens when you get an influential church leader 
or you know the Pope. I, I don't follow the Pope, but he, he, millions around the world do. And they get up, get up, and say, "We found the bones. We found the body of Jesus." What happens? What happens when, when we are in that situation? The Apostle Paul said, "If there's no resurrection, if you, if you find the bones, it's all in vain." So what happens when they produce bones which are not real Jesus because he's resurrected, but they're fake? And you've got a famous church leader who says, I was wrong, here's the evidence, you've wasted all your life following something that's not true. <clears throat> and it's convincing because of deep faith. So this is terrifying. This is some of those scariest things in the, what's going on in the world. Um, so it could be, this image, this image we've taught, could be demonic, it could just be some sort of thing and, and, and demons are powering it and it's talking, or it could be deep fake technology uh, and, and it's just robots or, or simulations, something like that. And, and it uses, now it can scan, it can search, it can find out who don't worship it. It says in verse 15, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship uh, the image of the beast to be slain. So now you've got this image who's talking like him, and he's saying this, and sees in the crowd someone not worshipping it, and says, this guy, off of his head. This is a terrifying thing, really, because that's what's going to happen. So it probably has some sort of QR code technology and it can scan and pick people out as well. Um, and this may be why we get the mark of the beast in some ways, because it needs to scan, uh, it needs to be able to control, and deep fake might cause people to say, we need a way to identify who's real and who's not. So the public might say, actually, we need all to be marked with a unique code so we can say, this is a real person, and that's a fake. So that might be one argument why the mark of the beast becomes so widely accepted. Um, verses 16 to 18. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So the image of the beast causes every single person to be marked on either the right hand or the, uh, the forehead. And as said before, Satan doesn't have original ideas. He's copied this from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, I think it's verse 8, but I just need to check. Uh, yes, it's verse... Uh, I'll, I'll go to verse 4 for context. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So the Israeli people had a practice of having the words of God on their hand, and between their eyes, or on the forehead, and the Satan thought, that's a good idea, I'm going to copy that. And what does this mean? What else has he copied? Well, in Ephesians, it says that when you're a believer, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So this is Satan also copying his own seal, so that those who accept the mark of the beast are sealed for him. They belong to him. I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God. That's my identity. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. That means I belong to God. But those who accept this mark of the beast are going to belong to Satan. It, it represents ownership. Um, but did you notice it says, all are caused to get this. Uh, rich and poor, small and great. And it says free and slave. So the slave trade is coming back. Um, so can I have, I think it's the, uh, oh no, this is the right size, sorry. 
So we've got the, the slave trade coming back today. It's estimated that between 21 million and 45 million people in the world are slaves of some form. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're doing forced labour, uh, but the slave trade today is, is, is normally sex trafficking, pornography, and people are being sold as objects to, to satisfy other people's needs. And some of you may have heard of the dark web. Has anybody heard of the dark web? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the way to think of it is the internet which we use is just the tip of the iceberg. That's, that's what's called surface web. And that represents just 10% of the whole internet. Underneath that, you've got the deep web. That's things which goes on, but we don't really know about it. For example, an email is sent, and before it arrives in your inbox, it goes here, it goes there, it goes there, it goes all traffic, and then it ends up in your inbox. That's the deep web. Then you have the dark web underneath. Now, the dark web is very evil and sinister things, and in the dark web, you need special adaptations to your computer. They're called, I think it's torrents or VPN or something to access it. You've got what's called red rooms on that, which is literally a red room where you watch people being tortured and killed and all sorts of things happening. Uh, you've got the black market on there where drugs are sold illegally, where assassins are hired so that you can get someone to kill someone you don't like. Um, weapons are sold and bought. And it's on the dark web now where you can buy people and you can sell people. So not only now have we got, as I said at the start of this message, we've got children who are, were legally allowed to kill, as long as they're only certain many weeks old, you can buy and sell people now, and the government know about this, but they can't really do anything about it, because this is so hard to trace. Uh, and what you've got now, you've got people who work in uh, intelligence, and their, call, their, their role is sin eater. That, that's their job title, a sin eater. And as part of their job, they have to watch these rooms, they have to watch videos of children being abused, they've got to watch people being killed, people being bought and sold, to try and trace and track them down and prevent it. But what's going to happen now, it says free and slave, we're going to be in a situation where slavery is not something which we hide in the dark web, this is going to be surface level, this is going to be accepted, because the Antichrist is happy with it, and people worship the Antichrist. And this is where society is going to head, head up. Um, so it's going to be legal, it's going to be completely normal. Remember, Jesus said, as in the days of Lot, in the days of Lot, when the angels came down and people were around the room, it, it, the Hebrew word for, for young includes children. So paedophilia was normalised in the days of Lot. Paedophilia is going to come back. In uh, the LGBT, it started off as LG, uh, lesbian and gay, then you added bisexual and transgender, now it's plus, and you've got Q, U, I, A, and all sorts of letters after. And in academia now, universities are not using the word paedophile, they're using the word um, uh, minor, what was it, minor attracted people. So now you get into terminology where paedophilia is becoming, where it's uh, remember the language people use for being gay, I was born this way, I can't help it. People are now saying that for paedophilia, I'm born this way, I can't help it. So they embrace it now, that's the way it's heading. Um, so you're going to see more people like that guy wanting to be a dog, you're going to see paedophilia normalised, you're going to see people trafficking, and it's going to become more and more normalised. Um, but then, uh, in Revelation 49, and I'm, I'm sort of wrapping up now, says that if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark, it, it, it says that um, they're doomed. There's no going back after that, and we'll get to that in the, the next chapter. But I want to point out, you cannot be tricked into taking the mark of the beast. When you take the mark of the beast, they, people do it willingly, and it's not just taking a mark, it's involved, it involves worship as well. Uh, so, so, for example, some people said barcodes were the mark of a beast. Uh, and the reason for that is, is there are dividing lines, every sixth number, so what barcodes have the number 666 inherent in them. That's true, but they're not the mark of a beast. That's just coincidence, I think. They might not be, but um, they're not the mark of a beast. Then they said credit cards uh, were, were part of that. And then recently, the COVID vaccinations, they're like, it's 
not. You might not agree with it, you might agree with it, but he's not the mark of the beast. Uh, I do think, however, though, that that is a test drive to see how conforming people can be to inject themselves with something we don't really know much about. You know, so you need to have a conforming nation. And, uh, and, and that's where we're headed. They're, they're, they're making a state now where we're dependent on the people. It's no coincidence people's bills and energy prices and cost of living is going up because they're teaching us to become dependent on the state. It says um, that they have to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. And, and, and the Hebrew word for mark there is, um, it, 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 it's like a sketching, a tattoo, an etching. I don't think the chip or implant is going to be something under the skin. I think it's going to be on the skin. That's what the text says. And they probably have the technology to scan it. Um, some guy has a Tesco club card tattooed on his arm, so we don't forget it. And he can actually scan it and it works and he gets his points. So it's the same technology where you, you scan it and, and it works, even though it's, it's not. Uh, a chip uh, as such. Um, so the Antichrist is persuasive, he's going to try and form, pe uh, get people to take this and then willingly will. Um, in July 2018, thousands of Swedish people signed up to having something implanted in them so that they can just scan the, the, the hand to, to do the banking or to open printers and doors. Um, in China, the public are controlled by I think the social credit rating is affected to their behaviour. So if they go to church or even an in-house private study prayer meeting group, uh, they will lose credit on the, 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 the credit rating and that they'll be denied access to restaurants, to leisure, to recreation, to planes, to travel, and, and they can't move as easy. Whereas behaving citizens get all the opportunities open to them. Um, the technology is already here for this. Um, I've got one more video to, uh, to show and then I'm done. Um, so we already have Mark of the Beast technology. Did it work? Oh. That's it. This is Amazon who made this. I quite like Amazon as well. Typically. So while that's loading, um, the other thing is um, the number 666. Now people try and work out whether that refers to anyone. And they've done all sorts of calculation and they've got from King Charles to Nero to Barack Obama. And there's the old saying, isn't there? If you torture the data for long enough, it'll say anything you want it to do. And, and it will. You can make any, any numbers, data, say anything, really. So don't read too much into that. Um, also, what they're forgetting is it's just like you. It's, it's in Hebrew, and we're using English language to try and calculate this. So already we're, we're using the wrong tools for the job. Um, but I possibly wonder whether uh, 666 is more to do with the nature of man. If you think about it, we've got body, spirit, soul, and as a, a non-believer, you, your spirit is dead, isn't it? But you've got body and soul still, so you're two-thirds. As a believer, my flesh, is, uh, my flesh is crucified with Christ. So I'm soul and spirit, but really my body's dead. So you're always sort of two-thirds, 666. That's the number of man. Um, and, and people will want this chip, or, or tattoo, or mark, or whatever. They'll worship the Antichrist, they'll love him, they'll want this, they'll be queuing up to get it. And I, have you noticed the amount of tattoos now? It used to be just on their arm, now they're on their head. People are getting the neck's tattooed and the head's tattooed. So even, I never understood why anyone would get one on the forehead, but people will be queuing up to get it. Uh, so I've got this video and then I'll close then. She uses lots of different cards and IDs to get through her day. What is all Zoe needed? What's herself? Introducing Amazon One, a free service that lets you use your palm to quickly pay for things, gain access, earn rewards, and more. Let's say you're grabbing your favorite coffee beverage, or heading into the office, 
or checking out. Just hover your palm and you're on your way. It's as easy as that. Sign up is free and takes less than a minute. All you need is a credit card, your phone number, and your palm. That's it. Since your palm is unique and can't be lost in place, you can get things done quickly and securely. And with more experiences on the way, Amazon One will help you get even more done, simply by being you. Now, Zoe has more time to do what she loves. Ignore skydiving. Enter, identify, and pay with Amazon One. So the technology is already here. You can already sign up for this. Uh, in Sweden, it's sort of mainstream. UK, it's not yet. Possibly because of our Christian heritage. Maybe there's some holding back there. Uh, but, but this is coming. Now, to close, you don't need to be frightened. We're not going to be here. No. You know, that, that, that's, and praise God for that. The, the, the world is going to be a disgusting place to live. It's going to be horrendous. But we are going to be gone. And our salvation is in God's hands, isn't it? He's paid the price that was on the cross. His blood was shed for us. And we are, as a church, we are the bride of Christ. And mm -hmm. there is no way that a, a, a group is going to let their bride go through this. We, he has a place prepared for us while this all takes place. He, um, he, he, he is, uh, he's got was ready to bring us home to him and we do not have to go through any of this. You don't need to look at who the Antichrist is, you don't need to look for a mark and think that might be the mark. In, in some ways it doesn't matter because we'll be gone, we won't need to ever experience this. But some of our friends might and that brings a real sense of urgency that we need to be proactive and we need to be ready to tell people what's happening, the gospel message, and we need to see as many people give their lives to Christ. Because either they don't, and they take this mark and they're doomed, or they become a Christian during this and they lose their head for it. Why not accept Christ now? Amen. You know, thank you, Father, for loving us and for protecting mm -hmm. us. And thank you, Lord, that you don't want us to go through any of this awful time that the Bible speaks about. Uh, but you're going to take us home with you. You're going to, to, to bring us to you, Lord, and we're going to enjoy our honeymoon with you, Lord, in heaven. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. And we ask, Lord, for courage. We ask for boldness. We ask for strength so that we can tell people who don't know you about you and see people give their lives to you so that they can be spurred to see God. I pray that you bless each one of us, Lord. You grow us, Lord. You teach us. Uh, and, and you move us, Lord, um, and that will be more and more ah. to you each and every day. Amen. Amen.